to do things while you can't. Yeah. To act while we have the money. But rushing through the process without the consultation leads to a lack of consensus, leads to um, a lot of conflict over these things. And where countries have taken the time, we see much more sustainability and support for the decisions. We've seen more than 100 different ways to promote good governance of natural resources. Some of these are new and innovative. Some of them are adapting tools from other places. These are consistently, though, a different package in each place. <sighs> One of the um, greatest challenges is institution building. And we saw this in Chad. There were two, two things that they, they were trying to do. One was to build the pipeline to get the oil out and get the revenues flowing. The other was to uh, build institutional capacity and political will to manage the revenues fairly and to manage them um, sustainably. The pipeline was built before the capacity building and institution building was completed. And the authors of the case study in Chad noted that in 2000, Chad was an illiberal, conflict-ridden country without oil. Today, it is an illiberal, conflict-ridden country with oil. The main things that have changed are that the benefits of retaining power are vastly higher. You need to get the institutional capacity built before the physical infrastructure is built. Because once the revenues start flowing, it's much harder to build the necessary institutional arrangements. And I would add here that political will is crucial at the top. When you have it, it's amazing what you can do. President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has done amazing things in Liberia. It's still a challenge. It's still a lot of problems, but it's continually getting better. One thing I would highlight just briefly here on the transparency. There's a lot of attention to EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This is a fantastic initiative that seeks to report revenues that companies pay to a government for, for extractive industries, that is oil, gas, and minerals. How much do countries pay and how much do governments receive? And you can tally them up and compare. And this, this really helps to reduce corruption in the payment. It makes it transparent. This is fantastic. There are 35 countries that are involved in EITI, and the countries continue to grow. This is only part of the issue, though. You also need transparency once the revenues are in get into government. How are the revenues used? Um, you need transparency in the contracts, in the decision-making processes, on the uh, impacts, and the I've talked a lot about civil society involvement. Um, I want to just note that the post-conflict process, and particularly around natural resources, provide a unique opportunity for introducing new participatory approaches. And one of those we saw was notice and comment rulemaking in Liberia, where there's a rush to push through the law, uh, the, the new forestry law, to ameliorate that, the implementing regulations went through notice and comment rulemaking, where they drafted the regulations, and then they went out to the different uh, communities and said, here's what, the, here's what the law says, here's what the draft regulations say, this is why they say that, what do you think? This was the first time that Liberia had done notice and comment rulemaking for anything, but it wasn't the last. It's now happened to our knowledge, at least two other times. Next steps. Well, first we have to finish publishing the books. You, you see three of them. There are another four that are coming. 
Um, we'll be doing that uh, through the end of this year and into next year. We're going to continue uh, the dialogue, but we're starting to look at how to apply this learning into operational guidance, and the UNEU project has been building a lot on lessons here. Um, also, using this to provide better technical assistance on the ground. And we expect to have ongoing opportunities to learn from projects. We, we have 150 case studies, that's a lot. I'm continually learning about ones that are not included. It's important to learn from these. And these are ongoing. We're continuing <coughs> to find out some of the pitfalls, some of the other opportunities, and making adjustments. It's important to keep talking about this. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to acknowledge the three other members of the Project Steering Committee, David Jensen of UNEP, Miki Yasu Nakayama of the University of Tokyo, and John Unra of McGill University. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, uh, impressive uh, overview of uh, a problem which haunts the world. Uh, and uh, here you can see what a successful coordinated research project can do. It has added to our knowledge. I'm sure that uh, everybody is like me, everybody has learned something he or she did not know before that, that presentation. Uh, before opening the floor for questions, uh, I think you should uh, give your uh, uh, yeah, uh, of the, your part of the uh, case studies. Have to be very quick. Yeah, you will be able to. <laughs> I have to leave. Afternoon. The objective of this session was just to provide a brief overview of a peace building program in Tajikistan as a case study. But in view of the time uh, constraint that we now have, I'll just make a few brief points about this on this presentation. Tajikistan is a very irregular country which is wedged between Afghanistan, Pakistan, China in the east and Kyrgyzstan to the north. The area of land that I've been associated with is the Pamir Ally mountain range which in effect is the northwestern extension of the Himalaya. This land area is predominantly about three and a half thousand meters and extends up to seven and a half thousand meters where the highest peak in the region is Lenin, Mount Lenin, the Lenin Peak. It's an area of land that's been the subject of uh, internal conflict in the, 1900, in, in the 1990s. As you can see from these few slides here, it is very mountainous, it is very dry, it's a very harsh landscape, but it's an area of land that is recognized for its very unique biota and its ecological integrity. And it's the integrity, the ecological integrity of the region that has suffered uh, extensively in the post-conflict, from, from the conflict and in the post-conflict period. The Republic of Tajikistan is the smallest and the most isolated of the new nations of formerly Soviet Central Asia and experienced 10 years of conflict in the 1990s that debilitated the country socially, economically, and environmentally. As a result of the conflict in Tajikistan, somewhere between 40,000 and 100,000 people died. Hundreds of thousands became disabled, livelihoods have been lost, 
and approximately one million people became refugees or in, were internally displaced, and more than 50,000 homes were destroyed. The economic damage from the conflict was estimated to be somewhere around 7 billion. Since the year 2000, political violence has ended, although there was a recent flare-up in the southern part of the Pamir just recently, and there have been efforts to improve the condition of Tajikistan's natural resources, which suffered extensively during the long period of conflict. The Pamir Ally Land Management Project, which is known as the Palm Project, has brought many parts of the Pamir community together to solve its resource management problems. And the main outcome of this work has been a long-term natural resource, resource strategy for the region that includes a legal component, policy component, and institutional elements. With a population of approximately 7 million and virtually no arable land, Tajikistan is the poorest of the new republics of Central Asia. And because it's e its natural resources are severely degraded, it has a very difficult future, economic future ahead of it. Ten-year civil conflict <coughs> that debilitated the nation erupted at the time of independence, when groups that had been out of power since the establishment of Soviet authority began to re-emerge. And these different power groups won initial elections, but were prevented from taking office by others who enjoyed power in the Soviet Union and who had had Russian backing, Russian backing to maintain power. The worst part of the ensuing civil conflict ended in 1993 with a settlement that provided for a sharing of power between the elected government and the opposition, but some sporadic fighting did continue. Decades of Soviet control over Tajikistan meant that, a few institu meant that few institutional mechanisms were in place to manage political diversity, and the new leaders had little experience in practice of political compromise. In late 1992, the United Nations Security Council, at the request of member states, authorized the UN to support a negotiated settlement. And on June the 27th of 1997, in Moscow, the president of Tajikistan and the opposition leader signed the peace agreement on establishment of peace and national accord in Tajikistan. The same president is still in power. The agreement addresses constitutional amendments, government reforms, and the amendment of some laws, including election laws. Since 2000, countrywide order has emerged in Tajikistan, and the 1997 peace agreement between the parties and the civil conflict has held. Superficially, Tajikistan's emergence from conflict appears to be a case of successful international intervention for liberal peace building. An important point is that internationally, Tajikistan plays the role of a transit state in which peace and stability have to be maintained for the safe transportation of energy carriers and other natural resources of Central Asia. But just as a point of digression, the geographic position of the Pamir in the southeastern part of Tajikistan, strategically it is forms an important part of the drug corridor from Afghanistan through to Russia. And various disputes erupt from time to time in relation to uh, that particular industry. Internationally, the Pamir Mountain region has been viewed as vitally important to peace building in and the future economic development of Tajikistan because of its rich natural assets unique opportunities for economic, social, and ecological development. Numerous peaks with altitudes ranging from 5,000 to 7,000 meters deliver water into further Central Asia, particularly the Dara River Basin, making rich agricultural production possible farther downstream in the semi-arid lowlands. But this is out of the region that's been the source of conflict. So although the deep valleys of the Pamir Mountains are only thinly populated, they are home to several ethnic groups that practice irrigated agriculture. One important 
point is that following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, subsidies were immediately withdrawn from Tajikistan and the lopsided economy was deprived of markets and, e and exchange relations. Unemployment increased dramatically with government retrenchment and closure of inefficient state industries. Some 80% of the population was either unemployed or underemployed with little or no income earning opportunity. But consistent with the goals of the peace agreement between 2004 and 2007, the inhabitants of the Pamir Mountains and the Tajik government partnered with the Global Environment Facility and UNEP to establish the Palm Project. The Palm Project has made significant contributions to the political, social and the ecological aspects of peace building in the Pamir Mountain region, but in, in particular, but also in Tajikistan in general. The capacity building, ecological, legal and policy components of the Palm Project address land degradation and poverty in a manner that has brought communities of the Pamir Mountain region and the national government together by using cooperative and participatory processes, including discussion and problem solving meetings, training and capacity building workshops, and joint field excursions and investigations. Also, the project has adopted a transboundary approach with Tajikistan and neighbouring Kyrgyzstan working together to take responsibility for ecosystem resources and to improve the technological, the institutional, the policy and the legislative environment for the mountain communities. This is very important because between the Pamir component of the Pamir Ally region and the Ally component, there is a lot of transmigration of both animal and plant species. So for that reason alone, the ecological uh, importance of the area is, is also seen as, as a, having a potential contribution towards ecotourism, uh, although it is a very difficult region to get into. A regional strategy and action plan for sustainable development of the mountain region was prepared through participatory process. And to ensure the implementation of this strategy, participatory community-based resource assessment, including land use planning and a series of micro-projects have been conducted at selected hotspots in the region. Governance has been a, an important component of the project. The 1997 peace agreement gave sufficient emphasis to the reform of constitutional and governance structures. To address issues of governance, the project incorporated participation, accountability approaches, predictability and transparency into the different project activities. So what lessons have been learned? Through the two phases of the Palm project, project development and the project implementation, the Tajik government and the communities have worked together, slowly improving their knowledge of sustainable land management and how it can be applied at a local and a regional level. The process has helped to improve trust and harmony between different groups as they have come together to solve mutual problems. Continued financial, political and technical support from international organisations is still crucial to enable the expansion uh, of the conflict resolution process and the peace building capacities of the country. The PARM project experience indicates that involving all stakeholders makes it possible take advantage of more optimal solutions for problem solving. Tajikistan, and in particular the Pamir Mountain region, still face many challenges as a consequence of the civil war. These difficulties of the transitional period are connected with land degradation and loss of environmental amenities, a high poverty rate among migrant labourers and the general population, the weak social protection and the decline of municipal economy. Poverty currently affects over half of the population and employment opportunities are still very limited. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ian. You managed to uh, present a very complicated and complex case in a limited time, which allows us to take a few questions uh, we have to get out of here as we know by uh, uh
by 4.30, but uh, let's use the last 10 minutes for a few questions and a few answers. The floor is open for questions. Yes, please. Um, thank you. I, I mean, that's just unbelievable when it's come together here and it's really reassuring. Uh, I was wondering, because I just came from the forest and um, land and forest management and uh, restoration projects upstairs, and I mean, this is really something that IUCN is very, very good at. So it seems like um, when you start these projects, why don't you go to the other corner of IUCN and get your scientists to really go and um, show people what would be an ideal way I'm not, uh, you're very practical and pragmatic, which is, of course, very, very important. But why not bring in these environmentalists and say that this is the land we have, this is your country, and in an ideal world, we would um, do this to the land management, the waterways, the restoration, how much is agricultural land, how much can you use um, what, once you have divided up your nature parks and, and all your common assets. So what are the commons of your country? What do you need to protect? And then how do you then move?